Uh, this is also uh, joint work not just with Vin De Silva, but with a uh, graduate student in electrical engineering at Georgia Tech named uh, Abu Bakr Mohammed. So I'm coming at things less from the uh, point cloud point of view and, and more motivated, motivated by applications in, in sensor networks. So in particular, let's say that you've, you've got an environment that you want to sense, you want to get information about an environment. There are different ways that you could go about doing this. On, on the one hand, and, and something that is very much done in many examples, is we develop some very sophisticated sensors. Say so we get a camera and we take pictures of an environment. That's a very, very sophisticated sensor. You, you can't afford a lot of high quality cameras. And the, the data that you get out of that is, is very complex and very precise. On the other hand, another strategy is you could just build a, a whole mass of very, very cheap, very, very small local sensors that can't detect too much stuff. Maybe, uh, maybe it's very localized, or maybe it's just giving you very, very low fidelity data, but you get a lot of it. Increasingly, we're able to build sensors that are smaller and smaller, consuming less and less power. So uh, as time goes on, I think we're going to see moving from complex sensors to simple sensors, but very, very small, and lots of them. And in those cases, you get lots and lots of data that has not been integrated together into a picture. And the hard part is, well, how do you do that? In fact, if you think about some of these very, very complicated sensors, like, like your eye, well, it consists of a lot of very, very simple devices that are networked together and that solve some very, very difficult mathematics problems in order to give you a picture. So the, the, the theme that I think a lot of people in this audience will appreciate is that if you use some topological ideas, that this is a really good way to go from a local to a global setting. If you think about what topologists do in, in homology, you have lots and lots and lots of little simplices. Each simplex doesn't tell you very much information, but you've got lots of them. You can put them together to get global information about your system. I'm interested in doing the same thing with sensors instead of uh, <coughs> simplices. All right, so the particular class of problems that we're going to look at in sensor networks are where we have some sort of domain and there's a, a, some collection of nodes sitting inside this domain and each node has some, some neighborhood, some radius of sensing on which its sensor is going to give you some information. And I want to know something about the, the aggregate, the collection of all of these. So these things crop up all over the place. In a, in a communications network, these might be cell phone towers, and this radial neighborhood is some broadcast region. And one of the problems you want to figure out is, well, do I have any, any holes where my cell phone isn't going to work? This might happen in a lot of surveillance problems. Let's say these are security cameras, spy satellites, sensors that detect some sort of, uh, say, radiological substance. And you want to know, have I covered my entire domain? Are there any gaps where there could be some dangerous substance? Is there a, uh, a tunnel where the bad guy could get from one side to the other without me being able to detect that? Obviously, that's a, uh, that's a topological problem about the union of these cover sets. And my original motivation for this comes more from robotics and automation. Let's say that these are, these are beacons. And if you plunk a robot down in an environment and it wants to be able to navigate around by triangulating off of beacons, well, you're asking some, uh, some questions about how many of these domains is my, uh, is my robot sitting in? Do I have enough visibility? So again, the kinds of problems that one would want to solve might be a completely static case where my cell phone towers are in a fixed position. I can't move them around. And uh, I want to know, are there, any, are there any holes in the domain? Are there any gaps? I might want to say, OK, well, I've got a hole. What am I going to do about it? Where is the hole? 
uh, I don't have this bird's eye view. This is just for illustrative purposes. Uh, I've just got the sensor data. Where's the hole in the network? Where should I build the next cell phone tower? Where should I send the security camera? For beacon navigation problems, it's not enough just to be covered by one patch. If I want to triangulate off of beacons in order to move around, I need what's called three coverage. I need all of my points to lie in three coverage domains simultaneously, at least three. There are also a lot of dynamic problems. If I have security cameras that are moving or spy satellites where the satellites are moving and they're sweeping out some coverage, if I have a, an evader that is static, so if I'm looking for some static object, how can I move these nodes around in such a way to, to guarantee that I've swept out the entire domain? Or in the, the most interesting case, if my nodes are dynamic and the evader is also dynamic, so the bad guy can run away, how can I sweep around and make sure that no matter where the evader is gone, uh, they've still been caught. These are the, this is a sample of problems that one might want to consider in this category. So current strategies, lots of folks work on these sorts of things. I'm not going to bust on random methods in front of this audience uh, because, well, there's a lot of interesting mathematics inside of there. And in terms of what you have to do to get information, there's, there's not much to, to compute. If you assume that your points have a nice distribution and your domain is very regular, you can prove theorems that say, as long as I lay down so many nodes with probability one, I've covered everything. Well, that's good. There's no work to do. But the problem is that, as Percy mentioned the, uh, the first day of this conference, you can't always say the points are IED distributed. If I dump a bucket of sensors out of the airplane onto a field, it's not going to be reasonable to make an assumption on the distribution. It's also not going to be reasonable in all physical settings to assume that my domain is a round disk on which I can prove theorems. So uh, if you want to deal with those sorts of variabilities, well, the other main branch of research in this area is using uh, geometry that mostly consists of a ruler and a compass. I measure the distances between the points. <coughs> I write down a whole lot of inequalities that need to be satisfied. But uh, well, it does have the advantage that your points might not be distributed in a very nice way, and that's OK. You get out the ruler, you start measuring, you say, OK, I know that there's a hole right here. But on the other hand, well, you need very, very fine sensors in order to be me measuring distances with that amount of precision. And you've got stacks and stacks of inequalities that you have to work with. And that can be a problem. So again, no surprise to uh, this group what we're going to propose as the, an alternate way of doing this is using topological ideas, and in particular, homology theory to build up local sensor data into a global picture. Now, this does have some nice advantages. It's going to give you a rigorous result. It's going to give you, at least in cases that we've done, computable results. The big advantage that, that I'm going to push in this talk is that it applies to systems that are, are coordinate free. I don't have to put a GPS unit on each sensor. That's something that I don't want to do if I want to just dump out a big bucket of sensors. <coughs> the other big advantage is that I'm going to try as much as possible to minimize assumptions about the, the domain that I am on. I'm not going to be writing down assumptions like, oh, it's simply connected or the geometry is not so crinkly. I'm going to have very, very, very soft uh, requirements in order for this to work. Now, there are disadvantages as well. I don't want to tell you about those. I probably ought to. Uh, at the moment, and this is very preliminary uh, work, as you'll see. At the moment, this does not scale really well. We can do this for hundreds of sensors. We can't do this for millions of sensors. Computations are, are pretty tough. Oh, dear. 
Let's cancel that. All right, moving right along. So uh, we've already heard some, some explanations from Gunnar and company on some of the basic topological ingredients that go into this. Let me be redundant and say it all over again. The thing that you'd really like to be able to measure by your sensors is something called the, the <coughs> check complex of a cover. So you lay down a collection of points. I want to know what's the union of these coverage domains. It's been known for a long time how to figure out the topology of that. You build an abstract simplicial complex whose case simplices correspond to intersections of these disks at, at various depths. So the sets themselves correspond to zero dimensional simplices, vertices. If I have an intersection between two of these sets, like this one right here, or this one right here, or this one right here, well, I connect the corresponding vertices by edges, and I get a graph. But you keep going. If I were to, say, slide one of those disks over, now all three of those disks intersect in this very small region right here. That depth of an intersection that involves three disks, I write in by filling in the corresponding triangle of depth one intersections by a two simplex. You keep going inductively. That builds a simplicial complex. And the, the theorem that's been known forever and ever and ever is that this simplicial complex has the same topology as the union of these disks. And I'm assuming that these disks overlap in a nice way. So let's say they're convex. The same <coughs> I mean the same homotopy type. So in particular, the same homology. But it's actually a lot stronger than that. So this is great. Problem's done, except for the fact that sensors can't measure this check data very easily, if at all. You see how this intersection is rather small. If I move that disk just a little bit, it goes away. That's not an easy thing to detect. And if I have a lot of sensors with lots of high-depth intersections, these are very, very delicate measures. So I'd like something that is a bit more robust. And to do that, we turn to the, the RIPS complex. So uh, point of history, it's my understanding that uh, Via Torres really did this first. And in fact, this was the way homology uh, was approached in the beginning. And then everyone forgot about Via Torres's work until RIPS used the, the same construction, a completely different setting in geometric group theory. <coughs> so, I'm going to be obstinate and call it the Via Torres Rips complex on this one slide, but from then on out, I'll just call it Rips. So uh, the idea behind a Via Torres Rips complex is that I'm only going to keep track of pairwise data. And if I'm within a certain uh, radius, then just like in the case of the check complex, I draw an edge between those two vertices. But now, I'm not going to worry about how things intersect. You just fill in. Anytime you see something that looks like the boundary of a two simplex, fill in the two simplex. Every time you see something that looks like the edges in a three simplex, you fill it in with an abstract three simplex. So you take the maximal simplicial complex that has this graph, this communication graph, as its one skeleton. And this is the right kind of object for a sensor network because you're not worrying about all this fine overlap data. I just want to know. You know, if I broadcast a signal, how many of you can hear me? And if you're all broadcasting signals, who can hear whom? That's the kind of stuff that is measurable. All right. So how do we extract check data from RIPS data? We've, we've seen this before, but I'm going to say all this again. Unfortunately, the, uh, the RIPS complex doesn't have a theorem like the check theorem. It doesn't capture the topology of the cover. And there's some very simple examples that you can draw. Here are two settings with uh, four two-dimensional disks. They overlap in different ways. But if the uh, separation between these is right at the boundary of the, the communication link, if anything longer than epsilon doesn't have a communication link, then these two systems have the same RIPS complex, even though they're, the topology of the cover is very, very different. This one has a hole. This one doesn't. So that's not so good. 
that's not so good. But you notice if we were to just increase epsilon a little bit, then the diagonals of this rectangle would get filled in. Whereas that increase in epsilon doesn't fill in these large diagonals on the rectangle. So by changing your communication distance, in this case very, very slightly, it differentiated between these two systems, which indeed have very, very different coverage properties. This fake one cycle goes away. And that's the basis behind all of the persistence results that, that you've been hearing about. So the, the thing that makes all this work is a persistence result on RIPS complexes that uh, this particular version I learned of from Vin. And the statement is, if I increase the, uh, the radius from epsilon to epsilon prime, then, well, this RIPS complex is definitely contained inside of this one because I'm just adding more edges, more two simplices, more three simplices. But that inclusion actually factors through the check complex. You can squeeze the check complex inside of it as long as your ratio satisfies this inequality. And the, uh, the hard part of this result is showing that that's the, uh, that's the optimal ratio. So, so question. D is the dimension? D is the dimension. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. I've written all of these slides in the past 36 hours, so you're getting the first run. D is the dimension. All right, very good. So uh, again, the thing that's been said a couple times is from functoriality, this means that you can get rigorous data about the cover just based on things that uh, you can compute. This you can compute. This you can compute. This you can't compute. But you can squeeze it in between two of these. Now, people are getting uh, bent out of shape by this word functoriality. So let me draw the picture. Uh, and I hope that, that this will make sense. <laughs> OK, here's a space. And I can compute it. I can figure it out. And it sits inside of this space. right? This is the RIPS complex on the left, RIPS complex on the right. These are good. These are observable. These I can build from sensor data. But that's not what I want. That, that's not the actual topology of the cover. The, the actual topology of the cover is this space that I've not illustrated because I don't know what it looks like. But I do know that this is contained in that, and that is contained in this. So this loop here, which is really a non-trivial loop, and it stays non-trivial in here, it couldn't have gotten filled in with a disk in here. Because since this sits inside of this, that disk that I filled it in with would have to be present over here. That's the, uh, you know, that's the uh, simple guide to functoriality. All right. So just using this, let me illustrate a, a toy problem. If I lay down a bunch of disks, how would I detect a hole? And I want to do so with as few assumptions on my sensors as possible. So let's say I've got a collection of nodes in RD. D is the dimension. And these nodes have unique identities. They all have unique ID numbers. And they're broadcasting those ID numbers. They're sending out ping, I'm node 11. The other nodes can listen, and maybe they will hear, ping, I'm node 11. Now they can't tell what direction node 11 came from. They have no orientation sensors. They can't tell how far away node 11 is, except in a very coarse sense. So they can hear 11 either with a strong signal or a weak signal, where it's a strong signal if you're within distance rs. S is for strong. It's a weak signal if you're within distance rw, or rw is some longer radius. So you can't tell how or I can't tell how far away you are, but uh, you know I can say you're either close or you're very close, or I might not hear you at all. And I have to have some sort of bound on the ratio of my strong signal to my weak signal that corresponds to the theorem that we just saw about persistence. And I'm going to assume that uh, each of my nodes has some covering domain of radius R C for cover. That's half of the weak radius. Is that the same radius in the strong signal and the weak signal? Yes, it is. So weak signal means 
you're within distance r sub w, but you're not hearing a strong signal. Right? You're definitely hearing a weak signal. OK, no assumptions about measuring distances, no assumptions about orientation, no coordinates at all. Just each node has a list of data, you know, who can I hear and at what signal strength, and that's it. So when I talk to sensor <coughs> networks people and give that setup, they say, well, go home. You can't solve anything. That's not enough data. But you can. You can. If you're given the nodes, you can build the strong signal rips complex. So I tie things up by edges depending on whether they're within a strong signal detection. And then I build the weak signal rips complex. And I compute the persistent homology. And I look at that. The strong signal had a loop, had a one cycle that looked like this. And when I filled it in with the weak signal, well, you know, the loop still exists. I could shrink it so that it's a little bit smaller, but that loop didn't go away. And that's, that really is detecting a hole in the union of the disk. Now the thing is, there's no coordinates. You don't get to see that nice picture with the disks. All you get is some combinatorial version of this object. You need to work from that. But uh, you can do that. It's very, very simple to show, given this result on persistence, that under these hypotheses, if you look at the induced map on homology from the strong signal rips to the weak signal rips, if you find a hole, so some non-zero element here that persists to a non-zero element here that has to factor through the check complex, which is representing the topology of the cover. So you really get that. But this is not a very good result. And I don't like this result. And I'm only presenting this for pedagogical reasons. Why? Well, I had to have the coverage radius exactly half the weak signal strength, and that's you can't, you can't really say that to sensors people. Your coverage radius is exactly this. And you have to be able to hear other people's broadcast signals with you know, this exact relation. That's not so good. Uh, it's also not so good because it's not giving us a positive result about coverage. I could have all of my sensors bunched on top of one another inside of this giant domain, and there's no homology that's detectable. There are no holes in that system, but it's still not anywhere close to covering. So that's, that's not so good. And well, there are a fair number of, uh, of challenges when you're trying to cover some bounded domain. You know, again, I could have everything bunched up right here, and there are no holes in the, in the sensor network, but that's still not telling me anything about have I filled out the entire region. And what's more, I don't want to have to be making assumptions about the topology of the domain. So for example, I might have a hole in my domain. I'm not allowed to know whether I have that hole or not. But uh, if I have a chain of sensors that's wrapped around there, I need to be able to distinguish between this case, where that chain of sensors is really doing its job and just going up to the boundary, or this case where I've got this chain of sensors and it's missing all the stuff on the inside. How do I say that without actually assuming something about the topology of my domain? Well, topologists know exactly how to do this. This is relative homology. And let me do an experiment here. Pointer, pen, red. OK, cool. This will work. So let's say that I've got a domain in RD with a boundary then you can compute what is called the, the relative homology. If I look at the homology relative to the boundary, then I'm not just looking at cycles. I'm looking at any chains whose boundary lies in the boundary of the set. So for example, this right here is a loop in homology rel the boundary. Why? Because if I take the entire boundary and collapse it down to a point, it really is a loop. It's a trivial loop because it bounds this it is bounded. It bounds this disk. I can shrink it all the way down. This is a loop 
it also is a trivial loop because I'm taking this entire boundary component right here and smashing it down to a point. So this loop really bounds a disk in relative homology. On the other hand, let me erase this, pardon me. This is a loop which is non-trivial in relative homology. It's a loop because everything in the boundary gets smashed down to an abstract point. But it's non-trivial. There's not a, a disk that it bounds. OK, great. So if what makes a coverage criterion work is the fact that if you look at the top dimensional Betty number of the homology of the domain rel the boundary, you get 1. <coughs> and any generator for that relative homology group has to cover the entire domain, independent of the, the topology of what that boundary looks like, independent of how many components there are. And that's what's going to drive our coverage criterion. So here are the assumptions that I'm going to make on the sensors. I have a collection of nodes. They're in a domain in RD. Again, the nodes have unique ID numbers, which they broadcast. And you can detect other nodes, either by a strong signal or weak signal. Same as before. I have to have slightly different uh, inequalities. I'll say what they are in a moment. Each node has a covering domain of radius RC, just as before. But now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let RC be uh, variable, as long as it's above some certain minimum that depends on the strong signal radius and the dimension. That's cool. And likewise with the weak signal, I can say my weak signal can be uh, variable. It doesn't have to be this, this one tight fixed thing. But as long as it's bigger than some multiple of the uh, strong signal, then that is all right. OK. I need a few more hypotheses. I need to be able to say, when am I close to the boundary? If I can't <coughs> detect that I'm somewhere near the boundary, then nothing is ever going to work. I'm thinking of, say, a situation where you've got a field and there are clumps of trees. My sensors know, oh, I'm up against a clump of trees, or I'm up against a mountain range. I'm not going to be able to sense anything past that. I can detect that boundary within some distance that is independent of the others, because your range sensors might not uh, depend on the communication parameters in your sensor network. So in this case, these nodes right here would be picking up on the fact that they're near the boundary of the domain. And what we do is we build a pair of RIPS complexes. I can build the regular plain vanilla RIPS complex for the system, but then I'm going to identify those nodes that are on the, the fence of the domain and build the sub-complex of the RIPS complex generated by these nodes. So I just take the maximal subcomplex generated by these vertices. And now I have a pair, the fence complex sitting inside of the RIPS complex. But I actually have uh, two pairs, one for the strong signal <coughs> and then one for the weak signal. And they fit together in the following manner by inclusions. They don't know where on the boundary they are. They have no idea what component of the boundary they are. But they can say, oh, I'm, I'm up against a wall. I send out a signal. Something bounces back at me. I don't know where on the boundary I am, but I know I'm somewhere near the boundary. So again, there's no coordinates. There's no uh, positioning going on. There's no way of saying this one is farther along the boundary in this direction. There, there's nothing like that happening. All right. I need a little bit of information about the topology of the domain. In particular, I need a connected domain. Otherwise, homology is going to get me in big trouble. That's not too bad. I need something that's a little bit stronger than just connected, however. I need to be able to guarantee that my space isn't pinched off too much. If I'm just taking uh, 
very, very weak, robust measurements of a domain, I can't tell the difference between something that's pinched like this and something that's completely disjoint into two pieces. So the assumption is that if you look at a, a collar, so some boundary of the, pardon me, some neighborhood of the boundary of the domain, if I remove that collar, then my underlying domain still has to be connected. The domain can look kind of crinkly on the boundary, that's all right, as long as when you pull away everything that's close to the boundary within this radius, then you get something that's connected afterwards. OK, given those hypotheses, which we've tried to make as minimal as possible, then we can state the following result. If I look at the pair strong rips complex and the subcomplex that detects the boundary, look at how that sits inside of the weak signal pair, and look at the top dimensional homology, so dimension D, where D is the dimension of my underlying domain, then if there's a non-trivial homology class here that persists under this radius, then I'm guaranteed to cover everything in my domain except maybe stuff that's right near the boundary. And I'll talk about where that can, uh, can go wrong in just a second. So if you have a persistent relative top dimensional homology class on this pair, then, uh, then you have coverage. OK, so uh, let me talk about intuition for a little bit. First of all, why is the, why is the collar size that, that particular amount? Well, if you look at what this gives in dimension 2, then this is the uh, fence radius plus the strong signal radius divided by 2. And, and this is the intuition for why. I could have a situation where I had a neck with uh, this point is in contact with the fence, this point is in contact with the fence, and these two points, so if this distance is RF, this distance is RF, this distance is RS, so they can contact each other, then uh, these two points think that they've just followed smoothly along the boundary like this. And they're missing this entire half of the domain. So that's why you have that constant. Uh, why can't you uh, guarantee that you've covered all of the collar? Well, it's uh, a picture like this is maybe instructive. You have nodes that are near the fence and near the fence. But if the fence curves, then even though they're in contact with each other, I might have a gap here where the balls don't, uh, don't go all the way. And in fact, it, it could be a little bit worse because I haven't assumed anything about the curvature of my boundary. The boundary could actually squiggle out like this, go back and forth, and then come back in. That's not disallowed because when I remove a collar, all of this stuff goes away. I could even have disconnected pieces out here as long as they're really fine structure and not anything that you're going to see. OK, so simulations. Well, this is preliminary work. We don't have much. Uh, it's possible to run this. We've run a couple of test cases using two packages that are available. One, the package developed by the Stanford group that you've seen running barcodes. Uh, we've also, Abu Bakr has run a different homology computation code that was developed at Georgia Tech. And in both of these cases, we compute the relative homology by coning off the boundary or the fence subcomplexes to a point. I'd like to be able to tell you we could run this on millions of sensors, but it doesn't work yet. Uh, on the other hand, we don't yet have any systems where we have even thousands of sensors that are deployable. That's going to change, I hope, quickly. Uh, in particular, we're not compressing the complexes. We're not using witness complexes because witness complexes need some Delaunay triangulation. Delaunay triangulations need distances. We don't have exact distances. This is very flabby. So here is a picture that Vin ran yesterday of output from Plex showing a persistent two-dimensional homology class for this collection of nodes that you've set down.
Uh, here, this gray square is the, the, the region of the domain that is a, a radius r sub f uh, color of the boundary. So all these points <laughs> are nodes in the fence subcomplex. And then these points are nodes in the interior. This is what the, what the cover looks like. Uh, lo and behold, I don't see any gaps except for maybe here, right at the corners. But that's OK. And indeed, when you build the RIPS complex, look at the fence subcomplex, compute its two-dimensional relative homology, you get something that's non-zero. It guarantees coverage, even if you're not allowed to look. You can't see any of that. I'm not drawing this with coordinates, because you don't have coordinates. You've just got the combinatorial data. All right, well, let me, uh, let me end what I'm going to say by reeling off a list of things that uh, I would like to do, but haven't done yet. So one thing that's really obvious about this coverage criterion is that if you've got a generator, you want something that's as small as possible. You want a persistent homology class that implicates as few vertices as possible. Why is that? You can turn those vertices off. You can shut down those nodes, and you're still guaranteed coverage. So in this picture, you can see there's a lot of redundant nodes here. I don't need all of them on. If I run even just an ad hoc local optimizer on my homology class, I get something that's a lot better. I've, I've saved energy. I've saved power. So one goal for future work is to come up with some rigorous results on how do we compute minimal generators in homology. All right, so another thing that one would want to do is let's say that this coverage criterion fails, and it certainly can fail. I'm not assuming that these points are distributed in a nice way. Well, if it does fail, start searching for lower dimensional persistent homology classes. That's going to identify holes in your domain, which then you can hopefully either go in and put some dynamics on those nodes and say, OK, we're going to move you around. Or you could up the, the broadcast power to that particular class of nodes and then try and prove a result that says, you know, given some bound on the number of nodes in this generator for this persistent hole, prove that the hole goes away after you up the broadcast radius. Well, one thing that you could do with homology is count kind of a hard way to count things. But it depends. So if I just dump a bunch of sensors into a room and say count the number of boundary components, right? these might be barrels stacked in a warehouse. And maybe I don't want to touch those barrels. So I dump a bucket of sensors inside. I have them repel from each other so that they try and spread out as maximally as possible. And uh, I want to count how many barrels are in there. Well, that's counting the number of boundary components in the homology of the, uh, the floor minus the barrels. So uh, well, if you just do simple-minded kinds of things, you're not going to get an accurate count unless you have coverage. If you do have complete coverage, then you just need to compute the rank of the zero-dimensional homology of the fence subcomplex. And that will tell you how many boundary components are sitting inside of there. And that's something that might be helpful. What's maybe the, uh, the coolest thing that you could do would be a pursuit evasion type problem where you have dynamic nodes. Now they're moving around. Or even if they're not moving around, let's say they're going offline or online. You might have node failure as a function of time. And you want to keep track of whether or not we've lost coverage. Or in a worst case scenario, let's say that you can't cover. You just don't have enough nodes to cover your domain. You're always going to have some gaps. But you start moving the nodes around as a function of time, can you say anything about whether it's possible for an evader to sneakily move through holes in your domain and evade detection for the entire time sequence? Well, it's pretty clear that the way to do this is to build some higher dimensional complex by stitching these rips and fence subcomplexes together. And then if you find the right homological criterion, 
let's say I, I found a two-dimensional class in this augmented three-dimensional complex. Poincaré duality would say, you know, if I have an arc that runs up here, it has to intersect this two-dimensional sheet that moves across. That means you, you always get captured at some level. You don't necessarily know where. But you could write down a rigorous guarantee that said absolutely no one got through the network, even though I had gaps and holes at every time step. And lastly, if you're trying to do uh, robotic navigation by uh, triangulating off of beacons, <coughs> then I want to be able to look at this cover and say, OK, what's the subset that is three covered that sits in uh, at least three sensors at any given point in time? And I believe that there are homological criteria that one can write down for that as well. But this is work that hasn't been done yet. OK, so to-do list, and I'll run through this really fast. The coefficients and the ratios that uh, I've written down are not always optimal. So don't uh, write those down, please. This coverage criterion can give you false negatives. It can say, I can't, I can't guarantee that it's covered, even though the system might be covered. What we'd like to do is run a lot of experiments on random distributions and say, how often does this coverage criterion fail? And that's going to be connected with this point very closely. I think it is possible to write down a coverage criterion without using persistent homology, using some tricks. Ask me next year. The biggest problem is we can't do millions of sensors. I'd like a good way to compress these RIPS complexes down that isn't going to uh, have to rely on any heuristics for giving a rigorous homology <coughs> result. What would be even better is if, instead of having a centralized algorithm like I've told you about, nodes get together with their neighbors and say, hey, we've covered our area. You know, forget about the rest of you all. And all of that distributed data gets integrated into a global coverage criterion. And then finally, if you start adding dynamics, saying that, OK, I can move these sensors around. I could do control theory. How can I do this in such a way as to uh, optimize the homology of the cover. That's it. Thanks for your attention and patience. Question. Yeah. You thought about criteria for saying, well, I don't have a tunnel through the region instead of, instead of a hole. Yeah, so that. Yeah, will you permit holes but not tunnels? That depends on what homology group you're looking at. So I didn't write this down, but if you're looking for holes, you can get information about the morphology of the whole based on what dimensional homology you're looking in. So uh, I have a question about D. Mm -hmm. Is the, the D the dimension of the domain or the dimension of the complex? D, D is the dimension of the domain in which your nodes are. So typically. So you don't need to know how, how hard the dimension of the complex is. No, I don't. I don't. Typically, so the people I talk to are interested about D equals 2 or D equals 3. Let's say you were doing statistics, and you've got a sample of points. And you know that it's a, a seven sphere. You want to know, did my points actually cover the entire seven sphere? Well, that would be a d equals 7 example. Or maybe you get some concentration of mileage by separating yourself to d equals 2. Maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, what we're actually computing is the RIPS complex, which can have very high dimension. Now, if you start off inside of a seven-dimensional name, your RIPS complex is guaranteed to be big, and that's bad news. So it's certainly going to get harder as dimension goes up. But even in dimension two and three, it's already going to be a hard problem unless you compress out the RIPS complex. So I'm thinking of an obstacle in a space as just removing that from the domain. And so looking at the, it, let me say this another way. If your sensors can detect, oh, I'm near an obstacle, then it fits into this framework perfectly. Because you just have that as part of the boundary of your domain. <laughs>
Right, so there is a very broad literature on coverage problems in sensor networks. And in terms of analytical methods, the only things that I've run across are, you know, measure distances, write down lots and lots of inequalities that have to be satisfied in order to guarantee that there are no holes. Either that or you make assumptions about distributions and you apply probabilistic techniques. In the situation where you can measure distances and you need Bellani, the Bellani idea, right? If you can measure distances, then you've got a lot available. 